I decided this year that I wanted to decorate for Christmas with a Victorian theme, but what exactly does that look like? I thought it might be perhaps a bit like the Dark Yule style that seems to be trending right now, but once I started doing the research into what an actual 19th century Christmas in the UK and in America looked like, um, things turned out a little bit different than I expected. For one, there was a lot more glitter. A lot more glitter. So much glitter. But things did start in a way that I expected. Generally, what we think of as traditional Christmas is all of the greenery, things like holly and pine, cedar, laurel, mistletoe, hemlock, sprigs of berries, both red and white, different types of flowers that are red and white to brighten things up. And these all make sense. For the most part, these are things that you can walk into your backyard in December and find still living. So basically this is all of the stuff that you could get locally that wasn't going to be brown sticks in December. Now there are definitely some popular things that are imported from other areas around the world or things that are grown in greenhouses, particularly the case when it comes to floral arrangements. But this seems to be the general expectation of what is traditional, anything that's still alive in December and will brighten the space. Because that is of course where the basis of Christmas decorations comes from, not something within the Christian religion and Christmas itself, as something that has to do with older religions and older types of decorating in the middle of winter to make things a little bit more pleasant to endure. So that's about what I figured I would find. Turns out though that that was just the beginning portion of what they had. Because of course the amount of time that it took to get around the world was rapidly shortening. Now suddenly we could actually import different types of greenery from all over the world and keep it alive. So apparently for Christmas, some of the really trendy options were things like palm trees or ferns, basically any tropical plant that you could manage to get your hands on, whether it was something like orchids or pompous grass, or in one case it even specified feathery asparagus as its fern of choice. So anything green, from pretty much all over the world that you could manage to get in. Now, of course, sometimes these things weren't terribly green. A lot of the grasses that came in weren't in the best condition, and they definitely did recommend you could go find grasses in your local area. But if you got some that weren't green or weren't a color that really went with what you were doing, it was pretty normal to then go and dye them. So you could have a brightly colored range of different types of grasses to shove in all of your greenery. They made up things like wreaths and garlands, like we would expect, all sorts of swag and of course the standard Christmas tree, but they also did a wide range of unusual shapes. I was surprised to find how much moss was being used to fill out different spaces of these big clumps of greenery. Then they would take different wooden shapes, sometimes with religious iconography such as crosses, sometimes with stars or anchors or other strange thematic things, and they would wrap greenery around those, so that way you could fit greenery into lots of different spaces around the house. Now of course they didn't leave this greenery undecorated. It wasn't just simply a swag of cypress over the doorway. Instead, they filled these things out with all sorts of different extra decorations. The Christmas tree, of course, in particular is prone to this. In the 19th century, Christmas trees really took off in both the UK and in America. They had been popular at other times in other places in different ways, but early Christmas trees were often a popular way to display presents, not just under the tree, but on the tree. So they filled these things out with all sorts of sweet treats, both candy as well as a cake shaped as animals. They would use nuts all over the tree, very often gilded nuts, so that way they add a little bit of sparkle. And that could be things like walnuts, peanuts, hickory nuts, or even pine cones. They also particularly loved the idea of cornucopias. And so they would build out giant cornucopias and fill them with fruit. Things like apples, lemons, and oranges were treats and presents as well as decoration because they were things that needed to be Imported. Then of course garlands made out of cranberries or popcorn. You could also take your plain popcorn and dip it in sugar, particularly pink sugar was a popular option. And if you didn't want to make garlands out of those, paper chain garlands were popular because you get fake metallic papers just like you can today. Then you can make endless chains out of paper and cover the tree, cover the house in these. It was something that was considered really wonderful and fun for the children to do so that way you keep them busy. Of course we also had the ornaments that you would pull out year after year and wouldn't be just taken down off the tree and consumed that year, but for that they absolutely love to go with more thematic styles. So some articles recommended themes such as cars or ping pong, others recommended brownies or fairies. There were actually quite a few mentions of putting a fairy at the top of the tree, but others got a little bit more creative, suggesting things like the Swiss Family Robinson or putting an entire estate on a tree so that way you have all the different buildings and the different grounds and people doing different activities. So you could fill out your entire tree with a thematic style. Now if this wasn't enough for you, you could also then go and have an entire 
entire Christmas room. And there are quite a few recommendations on how to go about decorating this. Things such as just simply trying to display the presents in a creative way with all sorts of greenery and different types of structures built up. Some, however, got much more um, specific. One recommended having a giant mountain for an alpine theme that you could build out and cover in fake snow and then all of the presents. Or you could build out what they called a Merry Christmas ship. So you could have an entire ship complete with riggings filled with presents. And of course, if you perhaps didn't have a household full of children that you were trying to ply with gifts, you instead, like many of us today, simply had pets, well, there were options for that too. Quite a few articles that I came across mention having a Christmas tree or a Christmas party for dogs or cats, where dogs such as Tiny would have all of his friends invited to a giant party in which they would cover a Christmas tree in meat. Things like garlands out of sausage, or in the case of the cats, little bits of liver, just basically any sort of of edible meat treats that they could toss onto these Christmas trees, then they would just literally let the dogs loose to destroy the Christmas tree and eat all of the treats on it. There were mentions that were a little bit more organized and demure, such as this one older dog who came to expect his own Christmas tree every single year and would lie underneath the tree filled with different meats and dog treats and growl at anyone that got too close gradually nibbling off of it over the course of a few days and then falling asleep into naps in between his feasting. But I, which I don't know about your pet, but I'm pretty sure that sounds like the perfect holiday to them. Of course, humans were not left out of the meat game for holidays either, and you could fill out your table with all sorts of decorations made out of meat. One article from 1902 recommends a centerpiece of mushrooms of glazed lard about a pool of meat gelatin, saying it's unique. Another option was deliciously browned birds tucked into wishbone cradles with snowy leaf lard blankets, which are odd as well as most appetizing in appearance. I don't know about you, but leaf lard blankets does not scream appetizing holidays to me. I did, however, appreciate the one recommendation for filling your stockings with cinnamon buns and then silly little phrases like, with best wishes for a spicy Christmas and an aromantic new year. But if you say wanted a creative Christmas display on your table that wasn't full of actual meat, the four and 20 blackbirds seemed to be a very popular theme and you could just simply go to your local milliners and pick up a whole grouping of taxidermy blackbirds for your table. And uh, if you would prefer live birds, well, then they suggested putting canaries into cages on your tree, so you would then also have live entertainment. Of course, all of this pales in comparison to what I like to call craft time. If you have made anything out of macaroni and glue, then you too can participate in making 19th century Christmas decorations. Because all that greenery, the live birds, and the dead birds combined was not enough. Instead, they really wanted a lot of sparkle. They wanted glitter and they got their glitter. One of the more popular things that I found mentioned over and over and over again was dipping things like oat and wheat into boiling water with alum, which if you've seen any of the crystal making videos as of late, does create very iridescent crystals on top of whatever you place in there. So these plants would come out absolutely dripping in iridescent crystals. If that wasn't enough for you, they really loved the idea of fake snow. Much like we put a lot of fake snow on our Christmas decorations today, they too came up with their own way of doing it. Usually started with cotton or wool in little tufts that were placed like little clumps of snow. Then on top of that went some sort of glue, changes throughout the years as to exactly what type they recommend. And then you would add whatever sparkly substance you wanted. The recommendations varied from anything from sugar to Epsom salts or flaked mica or crushed glass, which they said, yes, you could go get it from your local glass makers. And even some years you could buy it as a product labeled as frost, but you too could also just gather up whatever glass things you had that you didn't really want anymore and simply break them and crush them into a whole lot of tiny pieces, which definitely doesn't sound like a horrible accident waiting to happen. They even had a brand called Flitter that they mentioned in 1884, which specifically had all sorts of colorful different glitters that you could place on top of your snow puffs or really just anything you could manage to glue glitter to, which is a surprising amount of things. Now, if glittery snow was not quite your thing, you wanted a different type, you could instead go with paper snow, where you would take a large sheet of paper, cut it up into tiny little bits of confetti, and then take larger sheets of paper, ball them up with the confetti inside, place them all over the tree, and then have children hit them with clubbed walking sticks to explode the snowballs and send snow flying everywhere. In which I want to know, Who's going to clean that up in an era before electric vacuums?
You could also mix plaster of Paris with some water and clump that up as fake snow, or you could use the same glue as before and put flour on top of it. That was apparently a pretty popular way to turn berries white. If you wanted to turn berries red, you would instead use red sealing wax. And all of these ideas came together to decorate not only greenery, but also a wide range of different letters, where you would make up initials or spell out different Christmas sayings with these large, oversized, usually very gothic styling of letters, and you would cover them in fabric or in metallic paints or metallic papers, or you could cover them in glitter and fake snow, cotton, and all sorts of textural things. If you wanted a slightly more expensive look, you could use rice or tapioca. If you used it more erratically, it would look a bit like a white coral. You could also use the same red sealing wax or red dye in order to make it look like a red coral. If you wanted to organize your rice grains a little bit more cleanly, it would then apparently start to resemble ivory. You could also use dried grass covered in gold on top of the letters to make it look like large gold embroidery that you didn't want to actually spend the time embroidering or the money on actual gold for. Another use for all of your different straws and grasses was to take half of an eggshell and turn it into a fake bird's nest. So you would put glue all over the eggshell, wrap moss, horse hair, gray wool, different grasses and things like that around it to create a fake bird's nest, which you would then fill with sugar-coated almonds or gilt nuts of different types to represent bird eggs. That of course would go all over the tree, probably along with those caged canaries we talked about earlier. Now, of course, all of this glitter means nothing if we don't have something to light it up. And the most popular method of lighting all of your Christmas decorations in the 19th century was, of course, candles. They came in a whole range of different colors, so you could have not only the light from the candles, but all the bright colors when they weren't lit. Now, if this sounds like a horrific disaster just waiting to happen, you're correct. In fact, fires during Christmas time were so common that apparently insurance companies would very often refuse to cover the fire due to Christmas decorations. Most of the time, the recommendations were to simply keep open flames away from the plant matter if you can, and definitely keep an eye on them, but there were plenty of other ideas as well. Of course, the electric lit Christmas tree was coming in in the very end of the 19th century, the first one being presented in 1882, but it took a pretty long time for that to be something that was financially viable for the vast majority of people. Even as of 1896, they were still talking about it as the future of Christmas trees. So plenty of other ideas came about. One article in 1889 recommended a gaslit Christmas tree, which sounds even worse, but what they were actually recommending was a fake Christmas tree made entirely out of metal in which the branches are actually the tubings to run gas through. So that way you could branch off all the little tiny gas lights and hopefully not set anything on fire because you have an entirely metal Christmas tree, what I can only imagine looks kind of like those 1950s aluminum versions. Now, this didn't seem to catch on, but what did catch on more so were using tiny lanterns, specifically ones that were covered in colorful mica, and what they would do was put a kerosene-soaked sponge at the bottom of the lantern and a little wick that you would light, which to me sounds potentially just as much of a problem because now you have a whole bunch of kerosene all over your tree, especially if you knock into it and anything breaks. Doesn't seem like the best idea. And perhaps you might think, well, they'll just stick to fresher greenery. They had plenty of recommendations saying that you should only put up your greenery as close to Christmas as you could. Of course, if you had parties or other things, you had to put it up beforehand. That's where you would want to go in and constantly mist and water things so that way they stayed nice and moist, especially right before you lit the candles. However, unlike today where we have the expectation that you're supposed to take down Christmas decorations somewhere around New Year's Day, they left them up for quite a bit longer. In fact, the 12 days of Christmas that we're used to is the 12 days of Christmas with Christmas as the first day. So we're still going to have quite a few days after Christmas where the decorations are still going to be up before we reach the point of Epiphany. And that's the time where all of the celebrations and all the parties are really happening, so you'll probably want your decorations to stay up for those 12 days. Now, that doesn't mean that you take it down immediately after. In fact, there was a whole superstition about when you needed to take down your Christmas decorations by. February 2nd was at that point known as Candlemas. That was apparently the day that you were supposed to have your Christmas decorations down before. So it recommended on February 1st, taking all of your stuff out of your house and making sure that it was gone before you woke up on February 2nd, because if you didn't, that was going to be full of goblins. Yes, Christmas goblins. Apparently very much a thing, which 
of all the Christmas stories that I've heard about was not one that I have heard before, which was extra surprising when I started to research it, found out that not only did Charles Dickens write an entire story about Christmas goblins, but there are countless numbers of poems and stories and all sorts of concepts around the Christmas goblins. In fact, the Christmas Carol is also heavily related to the idea of Christmas goblins because they were the characters that were supposed to show up during Christmas time to let you know that you needed to be a better human being. So apparently, those Christmas goblins, which can show up at any time during the Christmas season to let you know that you need to improve yourself, will also show up to let you know that you need to take your Christmas decorations down. You haven't gotten around to that yet, and that's a problem. So I guess uh, take down your Christmas decor by February 2nd, unless you want to, uh, I don't know, spice up your life with some Christmas goblins. But goblins aside, it does seem like most of the Christmas decor they had in the 19th century would be very familiar to us today. I just didn't expect how much of our modern styles go back that far. The greenery, yes, definitely expected that. However, the sheer amount of glitter, fake snow, and weird variations on very specific themes, I did not expect. I do think, however, we should bring back those pet Christmas trees because that sounds like a pretty wonderful idea. However, I am definitely going to stick to uh, my more subtle, traditional, maybe dark Yule style of Christmas decorating for my house rather than going with the bright, garish, covered in glitter version that the Victorians apparently absolutely adored. 